Hi, my name is Josie and I am the girl that did put a finger down if you woke up two weeks later with a giant scar on your right arm and missing your entire left leg. You guys asked for a story time, so here it is, but you're gonna have to bear with me because it's probably gonna be a couple parts because it's a long end. Um, let's rewind, five years ago, I was a 23 year old mom of one. I had a 10 month old son, his name is Jake. I had been married to my high school sweetheart just under two years. And on April 3rd, 2015, I woke up at around 3 a.m. with what I thought was a late season flu. You know the works, um, achy, feverish, just didn't feel good. So I was working full time at the time, so I called into my work. My husband brought our son to the babysitter and I was home for the day um, to recover from what I thought was the flu. Around 9 a.m. I woke up and I thought, I'm feeling better. So unfortunately around noon, I developed Charlie horses in both my thighs and not Charlie horses that lasted a couple seconds or a couple minutes. These ended up lasting for six hours. I did everything I could think. I drank water because I thought I was dehydrated, ate a banana because I thought I was low in potassium, like for part two. Okay, part two, Charlie horses. So like I said, I had done everything I could think of. Um, I was stretching, I was drinking water, I was eating bananas and nothing was making these Charlie horses go away. And the only thing that would make them feel better was if I sat in the shower under hot water. So that's what I did all afternoon for six hours straight. I would get in the shower. I would run our hot water heater dry, get out, pace my house, um, get back in after the hot water, hot water heater heated back up and rinse and repeat. That's what I did all afternoon. My husband got home around 6 p.m. And uh, we had kind of a thing where you either do something about the thing you're complaining about or you stop complaining about. So I either had to go to the ER to figure out what these Charlie horses were or I could not complain about the pain anymore. So that's actually how we got me to go to the ER. So we got to the ER around 6.30 p.m. We brought our 10 month old son with us because we thought it would be a quick in and out trip because like I said, I was a healthy 23 year old. Um, so we get there and the ER was full. So I ended up waiting because I didn't look like an emerging case and I don't blame them because I didn't look like an emerging case, like for part three. Part three, the ER. So before this, I need to tell you that I live in an area where there's probably more cows than people. So the ER is kind of small. So when I tell you the ER is full, I mean, it might not have like a hundred thousand people, but it definitely had at least 10. But anyway, so we're at the ER and um, eventually I do get seen and they do some blood work. They started me on some medication that was supposed to help with the pain in my legs because I was pacing their halls because I could just not sit. I mean, it hurt so bad. I've had three kids and that is by far the worst pain I've ever had. Um, anyway, so I finally had some blood work and they started me on some medication to help me with the pain in my legs. And, um, this medication should have lasted two hours for every dose and it lasted 15 minutes. That's how bad this pain was. Um, so they got the blood work back. They moved me to another room and they decided that I was going to need to be care flighted out and they need to be, and I could decide. They said, check your insurance, figure out which of these five hospitals your insurance covers and we will get care flighted out to that hospital. Like for part four. <laughs> Okay, part four, we are still at the local small town ER. Um, it was about 9, 9.30 when I was moved to another room and they decided that we could get a care flight into whatever hospital our insurance covered. Um, I knew this was like 9, 9.30 and we still had our 10 month old son with us. So my husband called his parents and they came and got Jake, which is our son. And we have a rule that if you tell one of our parents, we have to call both of our parents, especially in an emergent situation. So my husband calls my parents and um, my parents aren't as relaxed as my husband's parents, so they just show up to the ER. And so I needed to keep them busy. And so I sent them to the local store just to pick up some essentials, like I said, and then put a finger down, um, hairbrush, toothpaste, toothbrush. I thought I was gonna spend a couple of days far from home at a hospital I didn't know anything about and I wanted to make sure I had the essentials. Um, so I sent them my parents there around like 9.30 and they got back around 10, 10.30 and I got really hot in the ER. And everybody knows who've been in the ER, ERs are kind of cold. Um, but all of a sudden I got really hot. So I just pulled some blankets off my legs, like for part five. Okay, part five, pulling blankets off my legs. So I got really hot and so I got pulled the blankets off my legs and my dad says, what's on your leg? And I look down and there is a bruise the size of a football developing on my left shin. And mind you, I got there about three, four hours earlier and that was not there. And I hadn't hit anything, I hadn't done anything that a bruise would arise. So my husband, knowing that that wasn't there either when we came in, went and got the ER doctor. And he came back in and he said, we're canceling your care flight to whatever hospital we chose originally. Um, you are gonna be care flighted out to this hospital and that is, you might as well not even check your insurance because if you wanna live, that's where you need to go. So I actually got care flighted out around 12, 1230 that, that day. Um, actually the care flight from my local ER to the big hospital is actually only like 15 minutes, but if you drove it by car, it's only, it's actually two hours. So my husband left as soon as the care flight landed and my mom, um, 
like for part six. Okay, part six, Care Flight came in. So Care Flight came in, um, my husband left because he knew he had a big drive ahead of him. So my husband rode with my mom and my dad took my husband's truck home. And so I get Care Flighted out and my husband had to run back to the hospital because we forgot something in the ER, I guess. Um, and he said he knew it was bad at that point because he walked in on the nurse crying, the nurse that was taking care of me. And no one really said anything. I assumed that it's because we had a, or my husband had a two hour drive ahead of him. But um, that's when he knew that there was something wrong. So I remember the whole entire care flight. It was 12 o'clock at night. I live in a small area. So every like larger town I went over, I was like, is that that place? Is that that place? They're like, no, you will know when you get there. But I remember all the twinkling lights. It was so pretty. And I remember getting landing on the roof. I remember getting pushed off the helicopter. My blankets were flying everywhere. I remember getting pushed down the catwalk. And then I remember getting pushed into the elevator. And then I don't remember anything for two weeks later. Um, mind you, my husband was driving there separately. He made the two hour trip in an hour and a half like for part seven. Okay, part seven. So we're at the bigger hospital that has is gonna save my life. So I was in the ER, apparently I was coherent and I was talking to everybody, but I don't remember anything. I don't know if that was shock or what was kicking in. Um, the surgeons actually met my husband and my mom at the ER doors. They were letting, they, they needed him to sign the papers because I had been receiving so much pain medication that I could not give consent. So they met him at the door and they also met him at the door because they wanted him to see me one more time because the surgery, the first one I went into, I had a 5% chance of coming back out. So they were doing their due diligence that my husband might not ever see his wife again. So they um, came back, let him talk to me for a minute and then I got pushed into the surgery where I had a 5% chance of coming back out. And my original diagnosis is necrotizing fasciitis. And it's actually like a 30 word long sentence <laughs> that it actually was And five years ago. I could tell you what it is, but I couldn't anymore. Um, I'm actually the fourth person in the United States to ever have this strand, only one to survive. Life part eight. <laughs> okay, part eight, uh, I'm getting pushed into my first surgery. So I tell everybody I had two amputation and that's usually confusing considering I have three in my limbs. Um, so, they actually went in and they originally tried to make me above the knee amputee. I got pushed back into the sick you, which is the surgery ICU, and I continued to decline. Mind you, I had my first amputation at 2 a.m. And if you go back to part one, I told you I started to feel bad at 3 a.m. So less than 24 hours, I was losing a limb. And so the first amputation was an above the knee amputation. They wanted to save my quality of life. I got pushed back into the sick you and I continued to decline. So they knew they didn't get all the infection. So their next chance was to give me a, make me a hip disarticulation by taking my entire leg because once that infection spreads to your organs, you're, you're done. You, there is no coming back from that. Um, so I got, that's how I am a hip disarticulation. So I got pushed back to the SICU. I started to improve. However, two days later, I started showing the typical signs of necrotizing fasciitis. <laughs> like for part nine. Okay, part nine, my arm. So two days after my amputations, I continued, I started to decline again. And this time I had the normal symptoms for necrotizing fasciitis. Um, my arm started to swell, it started turning red, it got hot to touch. Um, it's very painful as well, but I was on a ventilator because I was going in and out of surgery so often that it was just easier to keep me on a ventilator so I could recover. And um, so I got pushed into another surgery with the risk of losing my right arm. Thankfully, they were able to save it. They had to take um, all my muscle and tendon on top of my arm and they had to open up the inside. I don't know if you can see that. Um, to clean it out, but like, thankfully they saved it. And so they had to make a skin graft on top. So this is a little bit of muscle, but this is part of my bone that you're seeing. Um, after that, I started to improve and I don't remember anything for two weeks. I do remember a brief, like one minute I came about, I came to, and my husband was crying. He said, Josie, you lost your left leg, but it's going to be okay. Like for part 10. Okay. Part 10, two weeks later, I'm starting to come to, I'm starting to realize what is going on? Um, to be honest, I was in the hospital just under two months and I never lifted up the blankets to see what was. For anybody who has an amputation, they know that phantom pain is real and I felt like I had part of my leg left. I did not realize that it was all gone. Um, I am a right-handed person, so I lost my entire function on my right arm. So I had to learn how to do everything left-handed. Um, in the course of the just under two months that I was in a hospital, I've had 28 surgeries. I am a 28 year old person. I've had just as many surgeries as, during that time frame that I've had years on this earth. Um, so I spent three weeks down in the SICU and then I came up to the burn unit and I'm not a burn patient, but they just had the tools and equipment to give me daily wound changes. And so I spent um, an additional two weeks there and then um, I got moved to a rehab unit. 
like for part 11. Okay, part 11, um, I got transferred to a rehab unit. I could have went to the one that the big hospital had, but the one we chose was an hour from home versus two hours from home. So we ended up going to this rehab unit and it was awesome. Like car, church, grocery store, anything that you would encounter in your daily life, it was there. So um, on March 31st, 2015, I got to come home. Um, my husband had to make a lot of adjustments to our house to make it handicapped accessible. So he was up every day visiting me at the hospital. And like I said, for two months straight, he missed one day. That is pretty impressive. And then he came home at night and made our house handicap accessible. If that is not a man's man and a person that loves you, I don't know what it is. I don't know. But anyways, on May 31st, I came home. And mind you, I had a 10 months old son. In the two months, I got to see Jake twice. 10 month olds aren't gonna remember people they see twice. So I was a lady that he didn't know. And Jake's birthday was June 7th. So he wasn't even a year old like for part 12. Part 12, Jake's first birthday. So I got home on May 31st, Jake turned one on June 7th. And um, I did everything that I, every mom wants to make their kid's first birthday cake. And so when I got home, I could only sit at a 30 degree angle because I have skin grafts on my entire stump. And if I set up, it could rip the skin grafts. And I was missing my entire dominant arm. So I was gonna make a birthday cake sitting in a wheelchair at a 30 degree angle, missing your dominant arm. And while that sounds impossible, I did it because every mom wants to make their kid's first birthday cake. And Jake didn't know who I was and I wanted to be his mom yet. So um, we had his birthday party here at the house. My mom, uh, my husband's mom, my husband, they all helped. And the only thing I did was make a birthday cake and I felt like the queen of the world. Um, so life started getting back to our new normal. And then another show part 13 um like i said in the first video is 2015 so i lost my leg on april 3rd 2015 came home on may 31st 2015 and we got adjusted to our new normal in september of 2015 i got a prosthetic hate wearing it it hurts like a mother lover and i just don't like wearing it and my kids don't know me any differently so i got my prosthetic in september of 2015 and then on christmas eve uh or not christmas eve new year's eve of 2015 we found out we were pregnant so I lost my leg and got pregnant all in the same year. And that was a definitely an accident, but it is what it is. And God knew we needed her. So um, I dealt with my first pregnancy all through 2016. And in September of 2016, we had our second child. Her name is Maya. And we ended up having to have her down at a bigger hospital because they wanted to be prepared. Like for 14. Part 14, having Maya. So we had to go to a bigger hospital. And so while I was down there, everything went normal. I had a normal delivery and Maya was a healthy baby. Um, we had her on a Tuesday, we came home on a Friday and it was like a fall Friday day, normal. Um, my husband went outside with our one year old and I stayed in the house with a newborn baby. We had visitors throughout the day, no big deal. Um, our last visitor left around uh, seven and my in-laws came around eight and um around nine it felt like this big gush like big gush and i thought oh, i just peed my pants and i so i casually get up and i hopped to the bathroom and um when i sat down and i'm sorry for anybody that this is gross when i sat down those big maternity bags was like a big cereal bowl of blood and i'm not even kidding and thankfully my husband went to the back of our house otherwise i wasn't going to yell across the house um and i was like come here and he looked at me he's like joe's i don't think that's what's supposed to happen like per 15 cereal bowl of blood so um matt was like josie i don't think that's right and i said well maybe the squirt bottle's making it look worse he's like no that's not a thing he's like i'm gonna go tell my parents that he's gonna watch our kids and we're going to the er um thankfully he did that because you're not gonna go as fast as your vehicle can go with two kids in the back it's just not the way the world works so um my in-laws watched our kids i didn't get to spend the first night home with maya um and i went to the er with my husband when i got to the er um, my hemoglobin was a 3.1. Um, a lot of times you're pronounced dead at three. So I never passed out, but I remember pulling into the parking lot and I was like, Matt, I am not going to make this. I'm not. And he gets, he lifts me out of the car, puts me on a wheelchair. Um, when I left here, I put a new pad on and we put a towel down on the car. And when I got to the ER five minutes away, it, not five minutes away, but we drove like it's five minutes away. Um, I had saturated through both. 
and like for part 16. So my husband lifts me out of the car and he puts me into the wheelchair. He gets to the ER doors and starts ringing the doorbell like it's going out of style so that they would be annoyed enough to open up the door right away. And he was just pushing that wheelchair in no matter what. As soon as it was open enough, he was getting me in. And so then they um, pushed me back to the OB room and my husband said he knew it was bad whenever the ER doctor left somebody having a heart attack to come help you. So my parents knew, go back to the rule where both of our parents have to know. So my or his parents knew because he, they were watching our kids. So my husband had to call my parents. Again, they showed to the ER and um, this is my second care flight. And this time um, we got care flight back to the hospital where I had her at. And by the time I landed, my bleeding had normalized out of nowhere and everything went back to normal. My friends say I'm the only person that they could almost die on a Friday and come home on a Sunday. Um, we had a third kid in July of 2018. Everything went normal and that's my story.